Hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest Kahoot for Schools webinar. We are so glad you are here. If you are tuning in for a higher education look and perspective around dynamic student polling with some of our new question types on Kahoot, you are in the very right place. And we are so glad that you are joining in. I am tuning in from the East Coast USA. My name is Hannah Harris, and I am the community manager here at Kahoot and all things Kahoot at school. I'd love for you to take a second and use our webinar chat to say hello to friends, coworkers, peers, maybe even some new faces and new friends, new teammates and collaborators in our chat today. Hello, Clara. Hello, Michael and Fiona. We are so glad you're joining in, whether it is your morning, your afternoon, your evening. So glad to see you and so excited to learn along with you today. We have a one-hour workshop and webinar in store, and today we'll hear from educators and crew members all sharing how you as an educator in your own campus, in your own lecture hall, and maybe even in your own virtual classroom anywhere around the globe can transform your teaching with some super stellar, if I do say so myself, time-saving tools that are already available and already ready for you to use on the Kahoot platform. In our special edition webinar, we're going to be sharing how the newest question type on Kahoot scale can be incorporated into lessons and lectures that are specifically geared toward our university level students, their curriculum, and those embedded learning experiences. As you tune in today, always feel free to use the Q&A. Our chat message already has so many amazing mentions and greetings and hellos, but if you have a specific question that you'd like answered by either a speaker, myself, or one of the other crew, crew members joining in, please be sure to use that Q&A tool in the bottom side of your Zoom window. It kind of looks like two speech bubbles back and forth. This way we can track your questions and be sure everything is answered. If you don't notice that your question has been answered or attended to, whether as a typed response or answered live, always feel free to email us at community at kahoot.com. Should you have any lingering questions, we'll be glad to follow you follow up with you there. We'll also be asking so much about your own point of view and your own perspective, and the chat is a great way to connect with us and network from peer to peer. So again, the chat is a really, really awesome way to connect between different audience members and attendees, or even share a mention to the speaker or give a, a quick shout out. The Q&A is specifically geared toward that question and answer um, opportunity and facilitation. Before we jump into our first session, though, I just want to make a quick note that this webinar will be recorded and will be shared with you post-event as well. So should you need to step away at any time, maybe even to teach your own lecture or work with students in an office hour, not a problem. You can always re-watch or even review and watch again um, live sessions at your own pace on demand. We will be sharing out that webinar recording via email using the same email address you use to register. So check back in that same inbox or just check back on our event page that you use to sign up later in the week to stay tuned for that recording. We know, or rather we really hope that these sessions today are both meaningful and helpful in your professional development, your educator growth, and we're really, really excited to celebrate your learning with an attendance certificate too. So we'll share that certificate. I already saw some questions in the chat about how we're going to send these certificates, where you might find them. Just like the recording, we'll send those certificates out via email. So using that same email address you used to sign up, check back for that post-event certificate and that recording over the next few days by the end of the week, most likely to download and save for your own records, whether as a personalized copy to brag across your team or to and give yourself some kudos or to just save for maybe a future tenure application or to kind of spread some knowledge across your campus. But without further ado, I know I'm already at my four minutes mark, which is my signal and turn to share the stage. We'll get started. Kahoot actually began as a game-based learning platform almost 11 years ago now. We're reaching our 10-year plus anniversary. But did you know, actually, quick trivia fact, that Kahoot was actually created and our origin story is in that higher education setting. Kahoot was originally created, played, and hosted at Norwegian University of Science and Technology, but since, Kahoot has really reached all corners of the globe with interactive tools for student engagement, long-term learning, reliable data collection, and even seeing here that Kahoot is 
across and between so many different countries. I'm just scrolling through my own chat. I'm seeing Copenhagen mentioned. I'm seeing Massachusetts. I'm seeing Morocco. I'm seeing Iowa. I'm seeing Uzbekistan, South Africa, Mexico. Really, the list goes on and on and on. I can't even keep up. And we are so glad to be connected with such a global audience. And we appreciate you tuning in to share, collaborate, and ultimately learn as we go. We are going to get started, though, with our very first session from one of my favorite crew members. Don't tell the rest of the Kahoot group. Um, Joshua Scoggin is here to share some how-to processes for using Scale, including some of those best practices that really help on the creator platform. So hopefully you can kind of take away immediately how to create and play with Scale yourself. Welcome, Josh. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for the intro. Um, hope you're all having a fantastic day so far. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you all are. Uh, my name is Josh from Kahoot. I'm actually in Austin, Texas. That's where I'm based. So howdy to everyone. I'll give I'll give you that to start your day. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. It's going to be a little bit different than I believe was mentioned before. I don't think we're going to get into scale just yet. But I do want to show a little bit about what we will be talking today. So it is going to be about student responses with Kahoot and then enabling different methods of student feedback with our advanced question type. So I know a lot of us, we've heard about scale and poll. Those are probably the two biggest ones. Scale, obviously, really new. Polling, probably my most asked about question type. But we do have quite a bit of other question types available as well to get that feedback and that opinionated discussion-based responses, not really objective, more subjective question types from your students and audience. And honestly, it's one of my favorite things to talk about with my instructors in different departments I work with in the higher ed segment. So Without further ado, let's begin. I'll go ahead and start here. As you can see, my little my little cute avatar, that's me. Um, so again, I'm Josh from the higher ed team. I'm a senior account executive here. So if you have any licensing needs or have any questions on the EDU licensing plans, teams and departments, I'm the cat to talk to. So I'd be your go-to guy. But to kind of go into what really we'll be talking about today is showing off these other question types and more of the collecting opinions format. When I you know, discuss and uh, show our platform over to different departments, colleges, instructors. A lot of times we get asked about, okay, like we understand you have this like objective, you know, true, false, multiple choice, but like what else can you do? How can we get more opinions and more feedback from our students in a more organic way, start discussions and really have that go back and forth at to and fro to have these great conversations and getting that instant feedback. So what we'll be doing today is going over and beyond past multiple choice, true, false, into the more subjective, wanting it to receive more constructive responses from your audience, and then like asking questions to start discussions and getting that instant feedback through your session. So we'll be talking a few ways of how you can do that. And then we'll be showing off a few of these question types that really exemplify these things. And I, I really get excited when, when new instructors use these different question types and tools and really see what they can do in class with them. Let me go here. Perfect. So the ones we're focusing on today, Scale and polling are going to be on the way, but we'll be doing more of a drop pin. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, allowing your students to drop little answers on like graphs, charts, images. Honestly, really creative tool. It's so exciting how this is used, but I'm really excited to show that. Word cloud you've probably seen before. Maybe it creates like a snapshot or a collage of everyone's thoughts, ideas, concepts, a really good way to open up a discussion or end near the end of class. Open-ended, I get asked a lot a lot about. And so assessing coll uh, and collect qualitative feedback from your students, more of a longer stanza answering type. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then one of my favorites is brainstorm. It's super fun. You get to propose, discuss, and even vote on different ideas if you'd like to add more of the gamify points to it. But really, really excited to show you all of that. And that's kind of where we'll begin here. I'm I'm going to stop sharing so that I can pull up the Kahoot for us to look at. Um, unfortunately, we will not be playing this Kahoot today, but we'll be taking a deeper look at it. I'll show you on the editor side on my Kahoot platform here, and we'll uh, take a few questions from there. Excellent. So this is my feedback with advanced question types Kahoot I've created on my EDU team plan here. I'm going to go ahead and edit this Kahoot to show you all a few other bits and jump in. Um, perfect. So I do have a few of my question types already created. Um, you might see a few things on the screen I do want to point out. Um, I love playing with my themes, by the way, a part of the EDU and other basic packages is you have like different themes for like higher ed, 
professional seasonal holiday stuff. You can even do like your own custom theming. I love about it. I love my little higher ed classroom. So I do like to show that off, but I'm going to go ahead and exit that out here and then open up the question box we have on the left-hand side. So a few of these you're probably familiar with. You see some of our objective question types. Here are the more collecting opinions, one that we'll talk about today and a few of the other ones you'll focus on later in the session. Um, something else you might see, you might see our question bank here. Um, I like to say this is our like public library of good question types already generated out there. So if you want to look at topics, and things like that those already exist as well and then on another session we'll do later this semester is our ai question generator so if you have any like pdfs or topics you want to upload or uh have into the system these will actually generate supplemental cahoots and question types for you to actually have into your presentations and things like that more on that on a different subject uh, uh presentation we'll do later but i do like to call that out um, excellent. So the first is we'll talk about drop-in. So I'm going to go ahead and open this new one here. And essentially what drop-in is to get these feedback from your students is you're able to upload an image, graph, chart, however, you just click insert here. And then if you have one in our library, if you want to upload your own image, you're able to basically have these uh, charts implemented in the question type and then basically ask your students to pinpoint a uh, specific location on the image where they believe the answer is or maybe how they feel. I've seen this done with like anatomy, geography, charts, steps in a process. I've seen this done honestly in really creative ways. I've also seen this done with like icebreakers. So, hey, like, how are you feeling on a, on a scale of one to 10? Or like, here's like this mood, like just get something to get the, like, uh, I think the vibe going a little bit, but really love drop in. I am going to exit off this one and delete this question type because I already have one created. So one, uh, the example I have here is, hey, what's the method like you prefer to learn? Maybe I'm just opening this up, wanting to get some generic feedbacks. Like, hey, what's the way that y'all learn best? Um, I think I have like visual audio, like doing with uh, with that option as well. Um, obviously there's more ways to learn, but I think this is just a good way to kind of put it somewhere um, on this scale. And essentially I'll kind of show you what this looks like. I'll go ahead and click preview and essentially this will auto populate the answers. Now these are going to be auto generated, so they are going to be a little bit all over the place, but it just gives you this feedback of what this actually might look like if you did this post session. So everyone will be putting their little pin somewhere in your little image. Uh, you have some people in the visual, maybe somewhere here, maybe somewhere kind of in between just to give you that kind of sense of scale, um, but really cool way to get feedback. The other thing I like to mention with all of these question types is you can have these anonymously where it's like, hey, I just want an anonymous poll or anonymous drop pin. I want you to give your honest feedback, but I won't exactly know who you are. This will just be anonymous and you could put in your response and, and have it that way. But there's also a method of having it with a player ID. That's a part of the EDU team plan. So if you want a further way to identify your participants, a part of the session, that's also an option as well I'd like to talk about. But drop in's really cool. I love drop pin and especially the ways that they've uploaded various images uh, the, the ways I've seen this implemented is is really, really exciting. Um, Word Cloud, you've probably seen before. I love to use these to kind of start a session. If I'm talking about a new chapter or a new topic or review, like, hey, what comes to mind when you think of X? Like, what, what's an expectation you have of this, whether it's certain variables or maybe a certain theme or I, I, honestly, the ways this has been kind of done, I've seen it quite extensively as well. To kind of show you what that looks like, also I'll do another preview. You've probably seen this before and maybe other things, but that word cloud is just gonna be a collage of various ideas. So after everyone submits kind of what, you know, they think of this or, hey, what's kind of a, a uh, maybe a bias they have about this? Like what's the first thing they come to mind? You know, these are some things, the more time something is typed, the larger it is on screen. So obviously this is just general things. I don't know how many people are thinking about animals and food today, but uh, a really good way to have like that screenshot to kind of start like, hey, this is where we started. This is where maybe we're going to go, where we're going to end. So I really like Word Cloud to kind of fit these different concepts and kind of have that as a fun way to kind of kick off certain topics. But Word Cloud, super exciting to get feedback. I really love this one. Um, Word, or sorry, open end is a little bit different. And this is something when I get asked a lot with like, hey, I want something that gives me longer stanza type answering portions that I can get from my students. So I want more constructive feedback at the end um, where they can give me um, their honest opinions about things. Again, anonymously or with a player ID, it's up to you. But usually I have this near the end of sessions where it's like, hey, for, for this example I have, what is something we could do to assist in learning this objective? So how, what's something I can do to help you or maybe we can do better next time to make sure we excel in this area? Area. So whether that's something we want to get back, um, you can have that long stanza. So if you, I think it's up to 250 characters, and then you can probably see a little like highlight thing here. Essentially what you can do is have them even like theme or highlight a certain motif or a 
uh, more brand topic of what they're trying to get across. So it's a great way to get feedback in terms of, uh, like I said, at the end, more constructive, um, but long, longer answer types to get back on certain objectives you want to ask that. But open-ended, really great. Love this question type. It's one of my favorites, obviously. And then we're going to go over to brainstorm. Now, brainstorm is a little bit different, and I like to explain this in a few different ways because I, I think some people brainstorm's a little bit newer in terms of maybe how they want to implement feedback, but I've used this for like, hey, what are some things you might need to live on the moon? Or what are some areas you want to make sure we cover before next exam, for, for example? So essentially, your students or participants will be submitting different ideas on possibly things they want to cover. And you can actually change the number of ideas that you want to have them submit. So maybe I want to have them submit one idea, maybe I want them to submit five ideas. It's up to the range of how you want to have that handled. And essentially, they'll be popping in different things into their uh, uh, to the to their their app on the platform. And I'll kind of show you live what this looks like because it's really interesting when this all comes together. So your students will be putting in different concepts. They'll be putting them live. You'll see them pop here on the screen. Now, when these flip over, um, I think these are just arbitrary answer types. So uh, this will look like different food groups or, or et cetera. So it will be a little bit of gibberish. But essentially what happens is, oh, I think we should cover this or, oh, I want to make sure we cover this factoring solution or oh, I want to make sure we cover these steps in this process. Like I, 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 these are something that's important that I want to make sure we cover for next time. And essentially, they'll all be populated here. And what happens is these are obviously all, I think, auto-generated per se. But what it also does is it looks for keywords and phrases where they'll actually auto-group them into certain categories. So I'm going to do it manually because this system hasn't done it. But you always have the option of, okay, I see where you're going with here. I think these look very similar. I'm going to kind of put this in the same vein of thought. Like, okay, I like where your head's at. I think this is also the same category as well. And, ooh, I think this goes along with this. I think you all are in the same category. And what's really cool about this is you can have these certain groups together. And if you want, uh, just for like a fun little points thing, you can even vote on which group of ideas best fits the motif that you're trying to talk about or you want to discuss. So if this was something for more of a, uh, I, I would say getting feedback, but talking about things in more of a progressive way, we can even vote on them for fun. Or you can just say, hey, I just want concepts. I want to talk about it in a, in a group. Voting is not required, but it's something that we do have as part of the, the, the brainstorm question type. That's always a lot of fun. So I do like to show this off. It's usually goes off a little bit better when people can see, oh, you get the ideas, you can group them and kind of have everything kind of here in one section. Uh, wonderful. I'll go ahead and jump out of this preview. Um, the probably last bit I want to talk about is we've gone through all the question types. No, actually, that, that, that I think that puts a bow on it. Perfect. Well, I... Really appreciate y'all's time. I wanted to show off these other question types. I hope you've seen something new maybe you haven't seen before. But but again, show me these other question types of how you can gain feedback from students, participants, and other various methods maybe that they're not even accustomed to. Uh, it's super fun, super engaging. I, I really love the different ways we can ask these questions and get responsive feedback. And, and once you get that discussion going and having that back and forth with how they're thinking and conversations are flowing. It's more dynamic. It's just a lot of fun. And it, it's it's probably one of my favorite question types I get from instructors. And honestly, it's it's a really good balance in terms of what we have for our, our availability. Um, excellent. Anything else? That's all I have. Hannah? Thanks so much, Josh. Really, really great to see every question demoed. I'm imagining you multitasking both the Kahoot platform, sharing all of this great information and teacher tips and feedback. Weren't able to also see the engagement happening in the chat, but so many really excited responses around never seeing some of these question types before and being able to notice and kind of review what student engagement and feedback looks like in lifetime. Um, the crowd favorites definitely were word cloud and brainstorm. I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. And also no. a few questions saying, I really like all of these questions as demonstrations, those example tools that you've already shared and presented. Is it possible to get this Kahoot as a template or maybe even to review it on their own? So either after the fact, Josh, I'm not sure how readily available is to you, or even in the chat, if you'd like to share um, some sort of template to get started and for anyone already ready to kind of make their own and build from scratch, we actually have ready-made templates already available on the Kahoot platform. When you go to create your own by logging in, you'll have options to start from scratch or start from a ready-made template. So if Josh's isn't already available, that's a great backup for you already. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank y'all. I'm more than happy to share whatever I have. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. I'm really glad y'all liked uh, the other question types. Fantastic.
Thanks for being here, Josh. We appreciate you. We are going to continue learning and sharing how, whether you are starting from scratch or even expanding on existing Ready to Play content already available in the Coot Network, we hope that these questions across the creator really, really help to make for powerful learning experiences in both pre-assessment and post-assessment, specifically in ways that you can really, really differentiate your learning to be responsive to student needs, student interests, and also student growth opportunities. We are excited to welcome Kurt to the stage from Northwest University, who has tons and tons of insight on how the MPS scale specifically has really helped him to inform teaching practices, both in assessment readiness and also long-term goals and learning for students at the collegiate level. Welcome, Kurt. We are so glad you're here. Good morning, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. Good after good morning to those um, from um, from all over the world. Good afternoon to those from South Africa. Just checking if you guys can see my screen. I see that, Kurt. You have started screen sharing, and we can see it. Take it away. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, welcome once again, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be part of the panel again. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kurt Nyker, and I am a senior lecturer in the School of Accounting Sciences here at the Northwest University. I lecture taxation on the Chartered Accountancy Program, and that is towards students starting to become Chartered Accountants here in South Africa. I've had the really amazing experience of using CUD both as a student and now as a faculty instructor, and it's been an absolutely incredible journey facilitating myself as a student and as well as facilitating instruction within the classroom. So I'm going to take you through two of the new, the more newer type of tools um, that Kahoot has essentially developed, and I hope that you guys are going to enjoy it, and I really hope that you do learn something from this presentation today. All right, let's go. So the first one I want to talk about is understanding the importance of real-time assessment. Now, a lot of the times we've all been talking about how do I improve assessment in the classroom? How do I make sure that I get my students engaging? And yes, we do understand it can be quite tricky. You're not really sure what methods to use. You're probably not sure what ed tech tools might be advantageous for your students. And sometimes you're struggling to figure out or navigate how to use it yourself. And that's perfectly normal. But what I do want to draw your attention to is that sometimes the traditional methods have fallen short and we need to advance ourselves with updates in technology and digital transformation. And when we look at some of the tools that Kloot has created, these tools are actually able to provide you with real-time feedback that gives you invaluable insights into your student understanding of enabling you to monitor and track student progress as well as improve knowledge retention amongst your classrooms. And the two tools that I'm going to be talking about today are the scales and the net promoter score tool. Now, these tools, like I said, offer real-time student feedback that will help you engage with your classroom. The scale question type allows you to collect different types of data, attitudes, views, or opinions of all of the different types of students in your classrooms. And you can ask students whatever question you'd like, and you can essentially create a customized scale depending on the question that you want to ask from one to five. So if you had to ask a question around how satisfied students are in terms of the intervals that they've been given during lectures, do they feel a 15 minute interval is great? Do they feel that it's too short? You could ask them this question in a poll. Do you want to ask students how much of resources they would like? Would they like a lot of resources? Would they like a little bit of resources and perhaps more instruction? You could use this tool. So you could definitely customize it for whatever way you wanted it for in your specific classroom. And this is what's one of the great reasons why I use it. So I previously used this tool in my taxation class when we covered one of our study units, which involved identifying business enterprises. Now, some of the students did feel overwhelmed with the topic, and that's okay, because you're going to get students that learn at different paces, and they obviously process material through different times. So you need to understand the different dynamic of students that you have, and this tool is going to allow you to engage in terms of identifying what is the specific comfort level for my students. How many of my students are very uncomfortable with the content? How many of your students are sitting at around three? So are they indifferent? Are they impartial? What's happening there? 
how many of your students are sitting around four to five in terms of comfort level for your content? So you've won these students over. So you're able to actually see the split in terms of your class dynamic. Now, I know all of us would like our students to sit on a four and a five, but that's not the reality of the case. So this tool is going to help you engage in terms of that and be able to quantify and monitor your student progress. And it's going to help you as the lecturer to decide where do I need to perhaps redirect resources or re-strategize the way I'm delivering the academic content in order to ensure that students actually grasp the concept in its entirety. The next tool that we look at is called the NPS or the Net Promoter Score. Now, this is primarily used more in a product costing environment, but how I've adapted this tool specifically for academia was that I used it in my tax classroom again, and I asked my students how likely they were to cover a specific chapter in the prescribed textbook. Now, before I go through the results with you, one of the things I think it's important to note is that how the scale works is that zero to six in terms of the scale represents our detractors. Our detractors are perhaps a bit apathetic, if you will. They won't necessarily go and open that textbook. They need to be incentivized in some way to complete the assigned task or to execute it. So they need a little bit more of the motivation. Our seven to eight is our passive students. I like to refer to this as the more impartial indifferent, on the fence sort of students. They're not really keen on reading the material, but they're also not keen on not reading it. So they wanna know what's happening, but they perhaps maybe don't wanna engage in fully in terms of the classroom activities. Then you've got your nine to 10, which is essentially your promoters. Now these students are the ones that read ahead of class. They are always prepared. They've always done the work. They've got extra questions, they've made notes and summaries and mind maps and all of those things. Now, once again, I know we'd all like our students to sit at promoters, but the reality is that that is not always the case. And we need to determine and configure strategies that we can do to encourage students to move from detractors and passives and move into the promoter zone. A little example of, like I said, in my class, we looked at how likely they were to complete a study chapter on value added tax, which is one of the study units in taxation for chartered accountancy. And the students definitely struggled, more of them perceived towards the passive end. So it means that they were more indifferent or impartial. They didn't perhaps really understand what the benefits were in terms of completing or executing this task. And luckily for me, as a lecturer, I was able to identify this earlier on, better not as we get to the end of exams and then we find out that there's a problem. So now we can re-strategize and perhaps encourage some reinforcement learning for these particular concepts. So just to summarize again, your detractors are the students that need extra help. They're not comfortable with the content. They might find it uninteresting or irrelevant, and they need you to intervene and perhaps reshape the way you're delivering the content, incentivize them, if you will, and encourage them to complete and execute these tasks. Your passives, like we said, are somewhat neutral, but they still need some level of enthusiasm, some level of encouragement. They might still have some reservations or areas of improvement, something that might be prohibiting them from engaging with the content in its entirety. The last group, like we said, your promoters, extremely likely to recommend the learning process to others. They find the content more valuable, more engaging, as well as more relevant. And these aspects obviously would contribute to these students doing really performing relatively well in your summative and formative assessment acts. So once again, it's very important for us as educators and as lecturers to gauge understanding with our students, understand the data that we want to collect from these polling tools. But more importantly than collecting this data in class, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to use this data to re-strategize how we deliver the academic program? Inherently, in all classes, you're going to get some students that might feel uncomfortable to answer these types of questions. You can, you can ask students to answer anonymously. They don't need to log in with their, um, their full name, their student numbers or ID numbers, whatever the case is. Ask them to just put in an alias or an avatar, whatever the case is. 
but get the feedback that you need to transform the learning process. Again, these Kahoot tools make for great interactive assessments. What I like to do is if I've just covered a topic in 20, 25 minutes, stop the lecture, quickly open up the Kahoot, run a check-in with your students. Are they comfortable with what you've covered? If they're not comfortable, then you know you need to redirect some resources, an online recording, a video, extra practice examples, maybe a workshop, whatever the case is, to enhance that comfort in terms of this specific content. Because once you leave it, then we are going to end up with that snowballing effect. And you're sitting close to exams, 100 students outside your office, all with the same question. And I'm sure we all don't want that. Results are displayed instantly, allowing you to engage in open conversation. And that's what all of this is about. You have to be open with your students. Give them the opportunity to respond to the feedback, to respond to the stats. Ask them what their plan is working forward with these tools. Like I said, once again, in, in terms of my class, how I used to fix the issues, I reinforced the, the fundamental principles of value-added taxation. I tried to understand where is it that my students fell short? What are the principles that I needed to reiterate? By identifying these misconceptions or areas of difficulty, you can fix the problem now, guys. So colleagues, I just wanna encourage you once again, because this is real-time feedback, we need to make sure that we use it effectively to ensure that we give our students the best possible learning experience. Like I use this as well in my class where my students struggled with the differences between zero rated supplies and exempt supplies, and they didn't understand which ones were taxable and which ones were not. So I quickly put up this tool. I was able to quickly identify it. I created more examples. I even did a little video. And I can definitely say that the comfort level when I reassessed it was much better than the initial response. And all I needed to do was engage with my students. The proactive approach essentially helps us prevent misunderstandings. And once again, I must draw your attention to the fact that it really does take away from the snowballing effect of allowing these problems to build up and ultimately our students sitting in a very uncomfortable position before they write the exams. Identifying these areas of difficulty also help you as a lecturer to perhaps identify broader patterns of where students may lack so you're able to see that perhaps there might be arithmetic issues in the classroom, there might be comprehension issues, and then you can build skills that are linked to that specific weakness. Consistent trends in incorrect responses also will highlight perhaps where fundamental principles may need to be reiterated to students in order to allow them the opportunity to grasp concepts. The data-driven approach allows you to tailor lectures and features to address recurring challenges. So you can decide how you want to address these problems and make sure that these resources are necessarily available to your students to help them with their learning process. Reinforcing these fundamental principles involve you pinpointing areas of difficulty, whether through targeted review sessions, like we said, additional resources or interactive exercises. And these can ensure that students have a solid understanding of the essential concepts. These reinforcements also help your students to build better comprehension skills, as well as build confidence in the success of the topics that you've covered them. Lastly, as I conclude my session, I just want to remind you guys that these tools are extremely powerful in tracking and monitoring student progress, as well as allowing you to reinforce fundamental principles. I believe that by leveraging these real-time assessment tools, we can create dynamic and effective learning environments that will foster great levels of student success. Thank you so much for joining me today, and let's continue to harness the power of Google polling. Thank you all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kurt, for tuning in and joining us. And also thank you for everyone joining from across the world who is sharing questions and ideas and also some collaboration and insight in the chat. We are so glad that there's an opportunity for collaboration, both asynchronously, maybe after the fact as you're learning and sharing with your team, but also synchronously in lifetime. We um, really appreciate all that expertise that's been shared between educator and educator and across different campuses and communities. Thank you so much. We know that
Kurt's course experience, both as an educator and leader himself, but also in terms of curriculum is specific to those taxing, accounting, and financial trends. We are going to switch gears a little bit in that curriculum mindset as we transition over to Julie's presentation, who has a bit more insight and specific expertise as it relates to course curriculum and services supporting our teacher-to-bees, as I like to say, our teacher candidates. Today, we're going to focus on the differentiated and effective teaching tools from one to the next and kind of how you might choose or decide or even select um, question types that really create and cultivate those effective learning experiences, both in your current classroom environments and also to help you inform those decisions about what's next in your curriculum as you progress throughout the semester or even an entire year course. Welcome, Julie. We are glad you're here. Thank you so much, Hannah. I am so happy to be here with everyone this morning. So I know we're coming from all across the world. I am in Illinois, which has sunshine for a change, which is awesome. So let me go ahead and share my screen here and we will go ahead and get started right now. I see a love, that's great. Somebody else has sun and they're loving it too. Yay, 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 yay. All right, so like Hannah said, I am a professor of education and I teach educational technology and um, educational technology, curriculum design, computer science, and the occasional ed psych class that comes my way also. So wide, wide uh, gamut of classes that I teach. And Kahoot is one of my favorite teaching tools that I use in the classroom. I teach uh, both undergrad students who are learning how to become teachers and then graduate students who are already teachers and administrators who are wanting to kind of become administrators at the principal level or superintendent level and are in charge of purchasing power. And as we know, as teachers, we are very capable of uh, cohorting, co cohorting our administrators into purchasing teaching tools that we feel are excellent. And Kahoot is definitely one of those. But I want to focus primarily on how we can use Kahoot in the higher, higher ed setting for our instructional purposes. So not only am I wearing the hat of a college professor in this role, but I'm also wearing the, the hat of how do I inform my future teachers on instructional practices within their class? And especially at maybe the middle school, high school level of using scale questions. So we're gonna scale up our game today in this presentation. So this is me. Like I said, I'm a professor of education at McKendree University. We are a small private university located in Southern Illinois, about 20 miles east of St. Louis, Missouri in the US. So let's go ahead and look at the objectives because we always have those in any good uh, presentation that we're doing in a class or otherwise. So participants will leave with knowledge of familiarity with the concept of scale questioning, experiencing experience with scale questioning in a gaming format, which is Kahoot, and then integrate scale questioning in an educational setting. So no matter what teaching uh, concept or area in, from which you teach, we're going to look at how you can integrate scale questioning in all of those areas with the help of my participants here. So scale polling, what is it? So a scale survey represents a set of answers or options, either in a numerical or verbal form that cover a range of options on a topic. It's always part of a closed in question, a question that represents respondents with pre-populated answer choices. So you become an active participant when we're doing something with scale questioning rather than just sitting passively like you are right now. And that's gonna change in just a few minutes here. So Likert scales, Likert scales, are a very popular type of scale questioning. Those of you who have completed your terminal degree as a PhD or an EDD or a DBN or whatever other D in front of your uh, degree that you've chosen to complete at the doctorate level, you more than likely used a Likert scale in your research for that chapter for data collection section. So you're probably very familiar with a Likert scale. However, my undergrads really don't have any idea what that is. So if you have not had the great experience of writing that little book report for your doctorate, then a Likert scale may not be quite as familiar to you as to others. So Likert scales, like I said before, are widely used to measure attitudes and opinions with a greater degree of nuance, simply more than simply yes or no questions. So what exactly is a Likert scale? Let's drill down with some of this background knowledge before we can start to build on that. 
So a Likert scale question is used on a either usually a five to four point scale, sometimes re referred to as a satisfaction survey. Um, you'll often see these if you're doing surveys in food service or if you've stayed at a hotel. They're trying to gather customer opinion. <laughs> but if you're, again, like I said, more than just a yes or no answer here. So typically the Likert scale survey include a moderate or a neutral option in its scale. Likert scales, a little bit of trivia here, uh, is named after the creator of American social scientist, Rinus Likert, and are quite popular as one of the most reliable ways to measure opinions, perceptions, and behaviors. Compared to binary questions, with give, which give you only two answers, Likert scale questions give you more granular feedback as to whether your product or their uh, experience was just good enough or hopefully excellent, as our case is here. This method lets us uncover degrees of opinion that could make a real difference in understanding the feedback that we are getting, whether it's from our students who are sitting in our classroom or <clears throat> customers that we're trying to reach in our workforce. And it can also pinpoint areas where you might want to improve. So not only do we have the good accolades here, but maybe some constructive feedback that will help us grow and improve as well. If you want to get a bit geeky about it, which Kahoot lets us do with their uh, anal analytics that come from our survey questions that we're able to generate, we can come up with a deeper level of detail so that surveys can survey experts call the variance going on here. And the more important variance you have, the better you are able to understand the nuances in terms of what someone is thinking. So you're getting down to that granular level. So we're able to interpret the data and extrapolate it as well. Likert scales are often uh, great for digging down into one specific topic and finding out what people specifically think about that particular topic. So let's play. We're gonna play this Kahoot game for dynamic student polling. So let me get out of this question. You all do not want to see my email. Trust me when I tell you that. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and get specifically into our game. Let me move this bar out of here. And we are going to go into Kahoot. So using your favorite device, will you go to kahoot.it? So www.kahoot.it and enter in the game pin. And the game pin is 975. 945, or you can scan the QR code. Either one is perfectly acceptable. Now, let me tell you my favorite way to play Kahoot. My favorite way is on my cell phone, but I need to put out this disclaimer. Whenever I play Kahoot, I get sweaty because I'm not typically a competitive person, but when I play Kahoot with my students, I usually play along with them. Sometimes I've even been brave enough to allow my students to create their own games for recall or even if they're teaching a lesson in the classes, we will use the scale, I will encourage them to use their scale questioning to check for feedback for themselves in terms of how are they doing in terms of teaching new content to the class. So as a member of the class, I play along just as if I were one of the students in the class and they are the teachers. But again, I get sweaty when I play this. So if you're getting a little sweaty or your heart beats raising a little bit, understand I know where you're coming from here. So we have lots of people popping in. I love this, this is awesome. And Hannah, I have no idea how many we should be expecting here, but it looks like the pop-in rate is yeah. starting to slow. Keep Just them coming. a little bit. I wonder if we can break 100. I know that we have well over 100 participants tuning in on the Zoom. So we'll give oh some my. people a break in case they're tuning in as they're multitasking. But awesome. I bet at a minimum, let's try and hit 75. And if okay. we don't get there, we can always learn asynchronous. We, exactly. Let's see where we are right now. We're at 66 right now. Come on. we I know we can do it. We definitely can break 70. Let's see, we're at 68, two more. Grab two office mates so we can get to two or just pass somebody else, tell them to grab their phone and come on in. Six, oh, we lost one, 68, 69, one more. Yay, we've got 70, 71. Let's All right. do it. Woohoo! We're Can we get 75? I feel like an auctioneer right now. We've got 75, we go past 75 and I can talk really fast too if I have to, so. <laughs> All right. Well, in the essence of time, I'm going to go ahead and start our game and know that at any point in time, you can pop in. This pin number will always appear um, on my screen if you're watching. So dynamic polling, and we're going to pop in and out. I'm going to tease you with one question. Then we're going to jump back to the Zoom presentation, and then we're going to come back. So just a pulse check is what this is. How are you feeling today? 
and not fabulous to fabulous. So on a scale of one to four, four being fabulous. And I have to tell you, again, I live in the Midwest in the U.S. And we often have days that we do not see the sun, but it is sunny here. And our temperature swings are like this. So last Wednesday, we were in mid to upper 60s. And then by Friday, we had five inches of snow. So you know, I never know that fa that fabulous can go from the morning fabulous to probably 10 o'clock, not fabulous. So we have 81 answers here. Woo, that's awesome. I'm going to stop here for a second and I'm going to jump back to our Zoom because I want to keep going with our presentation that we have here. Let me jump right back over here. Back, oh my goodness, come on, let's go back into Zoom here. Hannah, help me here. Where did I go? Right now, we can see your inbox, which is no fun, but I bet, Julie, that you are probably in a minimized screen. We can see you, and we maybe want to see your slide deck. Would that be helpful? That is possible. Okay. It looked like you, yeah. So are we, we can see it? everything. We can see your slide deck very nicely and very okay. brightly. Awesome. <laughs> so let me go. Somehow it must have minimized and we are going to go to... That happens. I always lose my Zoom videos. They're hard to keep track of sometimes. Here we go. Go back into view. Slideshow. Here we go. Okay. Yay. We're back where we were. Perfect. Yes, it's loading. Okay. So we're back on the same site. So we're pausing here after the game. We started, but we're not finished here. So let's keep going here. All right. So when we write Likert questions, we want to be accurate. We want to be very careful with the adjectives that we choose to use. And we want to think whether it's going to be bipolar or unipolar. unipolar. And it's better to ask a question. So Likert type questions must be phrased correctly in order to avoid confusion and increase their effectiveness. If you ask about satisfaction for a particular class or a situation, what do you mean? Are, if I just threw a question out, are you satisfied with this presentation? That's a pretty wide open thing. Are you satisfied with me? Are you satisfied with the content? So we want to be very, very specific when we talk about the adjectives that we're choosing to use. Another thing that we want to incorporate here is, do we want a question where attitudes can fall to two sides, neutral, either love or hate? That would be bipolar. We want unipolar here as much as possible so that we're sticking with the same adjective. So if you recall, I asked how fabulous your day was, not is your day good or is your day bad? I wanted to keep the same adjective going here. So unipolar scales are easier for people to think about. And then you can be sure that you're at one end of the spectrum or the other, which makes the methodology much more sound when you go to analyze that data and extrapolate it out. When you're using words to ask about your concept, you want to make sure that everyone understands the meaning behind that particular response. So as I was writing that first question, I really struggled with the accurate, the adjective that I was going to use. I, I started with, um, are you comfortable? And it was like, mm, I'm not quite sure. Let's see where we go with this. How is your day? I left it blank like that very vague. That wasn't enough for me. I needed to drill down. And I thought everyone knows what fabulous means. You have your own definition of fabulous, but fabulous to me means you're pretty darn good at the time. So I thought fabulous was a great adjective for me to use. So statements can impact risk. And I asked a question, if I use a statement, most people will tend to agree rather than disagree because typically we're positive people. That phenomenon is actually called acquiescence response bias. And if you've worked on that doctorate, you know we want to try and eliminate bias as much as possible in our questioning here, not only with our students, but teaching good pedagogy as well. So five extra little tips here as you're starting to write and incorporate scale questioning into your class pedagogy and methodology that you're using with your students in the classroom in higher ed. You want to keep it labeled. You want to keep it odd. You want to keep it continuous and make it inclusive and keep it logical. So keep it odd. Sometimes with odd number values, you have a midpoint. How many options would you give people? Respondents have difficult defining their point of view on scale, anything greater than seven. So keep it somewhat manageable here. Um, I like to actually go against the keeping it odd and I like to use even numbers. The experts will say, keep it odd so you've got a midpoint. I like to keep it even so that people are forced to pick a side one way or the other. Um, keep it continuous. Opinion uh, Response options in scale should be equally spaced from each other. And Kahoot does that for us. So we don't have to worry about that. If you had a, a difference in terms of spacing, people may tend to fall one way or the other here. And then keep it logical so that it makes sense 
to people. You want to add a skip logic for students to be able to take some time if they need that to think in what they're doing. So other possible uses are entrance tickets, pulse checks, which is what we did in the beginning, an exit ticket, and then mid-semester faculty evaluations. But I want to hear from all of you before we go back to Kahoot and keep playing. How do you use or how do you envision using uh, scale questioning in your classroom teaching? You can either unmute and try shout out. I believe that's possible, right, Hannah? Otherwise, Hannah's no, monitoring. No, yeah, we can't unmute, unfortunately, though it would be really fun to hear voices from around the world. Um, <laughs> all of our attendees are more than welcome and definitely encouraged and invited to share ideas in the chat. I see we have a reply from Anna or Anna who's sharing icebreakers and exit slips in their Absolutely. possible use case. And I'm imagining that lots of typing is happening behind <laughs> the screen right now. And I'll happily share Excellent. some more answers. So I taught kindergarten prior to coming to higher ed. Well, I taught a couple other grades too, but kindergarten. So I'm used to chaos. So all the voices chatting out or that music to my ears. But yes, I do understand that we would not want that on a Zoom like this. I see icebreakers, quizzes, test review, end of class evaluations and feedback. I agree. And it's cool to see the echo of everything that you're sharing and kind of, Julie, the, the expertise that we imagine. And then also the specific use case, Natalia is saying pulse checks and icebreakers. Andrea is saying feedback. I agree. Wonderful, wonderful. So mid-semester faculty evaluation, let me talk just for a second about that before we jump back into Kahoot and say we have a lot of junior faculty on our campus, junior faculty members. And for our university, our evaluations are done through a completely different system that the university generates out. But if I were a non-tenured faculty member, I would want to know how my students are feeling prior to that very high stakes evaluation that was done at the end of the semester. And I can't make any course corrections after the evaluation feedback come in. In our cases, and I imagine for many of you too, uh, the evaluation is up for the students to complete prior to the end of the course, but I'm not able to see their feedback until two to three weeks after the semester has ended and it's always anonymous. And so I love the anonymity that comes in with my faculty evaluations. And I would encourage you to use the aliases if you were to do mid-semester faculty evaluations. But by doing something that you've created on your own, you can tailor it to your specific needs. Oftentimes those faculty evaluations are generic that the university is using campus-wide. So to be able to tailor this a little more specific to my course and my teaching style would be very helpful. And in addition to that, it would allow me to be able to make any course corrections. If I see, gosh, students are just really not loving that 50 page midterm assignment uh, paper that I had them write. And I know that's gonna come out in my evaluations. What could I do differently? Could I ask my students to do something like create a Kahoot where they are incorporating a presentation and a Kahoot that builds off of that with instructor notes that have to be annotated that show still their understanding of the concept, but it's a little more actively engaged and may meet their learning style a little bit better. Might be something that I could course correct and use, just an idea. So I'm gonna hop back into our Kahoot as we start to end here and finish our game. So back into our game. So if you kept that tab up, we're gonna go to three more questions here. So it's a scale question. And this one, I actually uh, created the scale myself, same as in the first one, but how proficient are you in creating scale questions for instructional purposes? So we have a scale of not proficient to very proficient. And at the very end, we'll have time to look at our uh, data and what it looks like at the end as we wrap up here. So I have answers coming in here, yay. One thing that I like about Kahoot and using these scale questions is I can customize and I can customize the numeric, such, the numeric scale and I can customize my labels as well, which is very nice so that I can make sure my label matches the adjective and the verb that I am create, that I'm using in my questioning. This one is an NPS scale. So how, how likely are you to incorporate scale questions in your own teaching? we have from not likely at all to extremely likely. And this was one that I let uh, Kahoot just generate for me on the NPS scale. And we have lots of different 
options and numbers coming in for us. That's awesome. And if you have a question, make sure to go ahead and pop it into the chat that Hannah's monitoring for us. And then our final question is a regular scale question. Was, was this training informational? So again, on a scale of one to four, you strongly agree to you, uh, you disagree, you strongly disagree to you strongly agree. Go ahead and pop on in for me with your answers. And then we'll view our data in just a minute as we wrap up our time together. And Julie, in case we don't have time to wrap up that data, I know that we're already a few minutes behind with one okay. more session left to squeeze in. I so, so encourage everyone to kind of navigate on their own. Hopefully they feel like all of our participants tuning, tuning in, whether from this session or from our others, feel very much equipped. But I am hopeful and excited for an opportunity for everyone to kind of try out that data and look at those reports after the fact as well. Excellent. Excellent. So we will end right here. Here, let me go back into view and show you the very end, which is just uh, my contact information in case you need to reach me and the re references that I had with SurveyMonkey to get some more information. Thank you so much for your, for your time here. Have a great day and enjoy the Kahoot process here. Thank you so much, Julie. I'm sorry to shuffle no, you up. Page so abruptly, so much to share. And I know, and I appreciate you sharing your contact information too. In case anyone would like that opportunity to follow up with Julie, or feel free to always reach out to us on the Kahoot side. We're at community at Kahoot.com should you have any questions. And we're always helpful or always happy to give some helpful one on one support where you might need it so that you feel excited and empowered as well. But without further ado, we are going to continue on to our very last session of the day, really, really honing in on that student engagement and responsive teaching, this time with a little bit of a different format and tool. We're going to be introduced and have firsthand experience with the latest addition to the Kahoot group of activities called Sparks. And Club is here to really show us that know-how, the how-to behind the scenes, and also give you a really, really specific use case for higher ed so that you can share across your courses and curriculums right away. Welcome, Club. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Kahoot Sparks, like what Hannah mentioned. It's our newest tool. It's still in like early access right now. It's currently for our EDU um, subscribers. And I'm going to share my screen here. We don't have time to actually play Sparks today, but I can show you uh, what Sparks is like. So Sparks was created as an alternative to our very loved classic Kahoot multiple choice game. So Sparks is actually non-competitive. It doesn't have a podium. It doesn't have a timer, but it's more about open-ended expression of student ideas. And it can be used. Um, a great use case for it is for brainstorming. So normally, you know, when you want to brainstorm with students, they you ask a question, for example, design me X. But how does that help them tap into their creativity? With Sparks, you can scaffold that by asking smaller questions and it builds their ideas towards um, the final challenge. So with Kahoot Sparks, even though you see this picture with kids, it's actually applicable to kindergarten kids all the way to a corporate setting, like we've used it in our meetings for brainstorming before as well. Okay, so Sparks, uh, this is what the website looks like right now. It's at sparks.kahoot.it. You can see that with Sparks right now, we have a few templates, like how you can use choose Kahoot quizzes to play right away. Um, a lot of our templates right now are more on the creativity side, like you wanna design something with your students. An example that I have prepared for higher ed actually was that suppose you're not the professor, but you are in um, your faculty meeting and you want to create a new student orientation activity that's fun. Like, how do you think of that? So the way Sparks would do it is that we would ask smaller questions first. For example, like, what's the place on campus? And with that, people can draw or write in their responses for a place on campus. The next question you could probably ask is, hey, what's a 
playful action that we can do with our students. Maybe people write in jumping um, or playing tag or things like that. When you have these idea sparks, the magic of um, Kahoot Sparks is that you're going to remix everyone's answers to create a new idea. So if we the final challenge is how might you create a new student activity? You're going to get someone else's answer from a place. You'll get a place and you'll get a, an action, like a playful action. And suppose I got the library and jumping. Then now with library and jumping, I'm going to have to create a whole new idea just from that. So with this constraint that student generated, uh, they're going to be engaged in creative ideation, we want to allow for student voice and choice. And this also helps build ready future ready skills like collaboration, building on other people's ideas, communicating their and expressing their thoughts. Uh, and this is designed for an inclusive classroom because you're not rushing anybody, but it's about evaluating ideas. So sparks can be used in a lot of different ways, you can use it as a warm up in the class. It doesn't have to be related to your subject at all. For example, um, create a new, design a new school mascot, just as a warm up. But it could also be used to brainstorm project ideas. And this could happen when students are blanking, like we don't know what to do. And you can use this as one of the ways you can, um, assess student understanding using Sparks as um, application. You can have application questions for them to review their understanding. So yes, this is Sparks Akarhood IIT. If you want to explore it, you can go to that website. We are ready to help support you if you want to use Sparks in your classrooms, but you're not really sure how to start. So you can always contact us at clubl at kahoot.com or Louisa R at kahoot.com. And I think we're out of time, right, Amazing. Hannah? Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for giving us that quick peek at Sparks. And so, so excited for those in our higher ed um, university and institutional levels to share feedback and really try out Sparks in your own classroom. So definitely, definitely connect with us if you have some ideas or even some potential course plans and curriculum to support Sparks. We're so curious to see kind of what's happening in your own um, buildings and across your own campuses. And at this point, it is 11.02 a.m. my time, East Coast USA, wherever it is your time. We are in two minutes past the hour which means our webinar and workshop has really, really flown by, at least in my perspective, and I'm hoping for your case too. We've learned so much, and just a quick recap, that includes the how-to of Kahoot, and, and specifically in those creator tools with scale, with MPS scale, with polls, and of course, sparks to round out that interactive learning experience. We really, really hope and are excited for you to apply this ready to play knowledge in your own course curriculums and would love to always stay in touch. So please tag us at Kahoot on socials or get in touch with us at community at Kahoot.com so we can see what you and all of your students or maybe your staff members and team members are up to. We love learning alongside you. We also hope that you stay tuned over the next few days to collect both your attendance certificate and that on-demand recording. We'll have that live version of our workshop ready for you to refer back to or to even share with your colleagues and across your campus over the next few days. We are so glad you are joining us and we so appreciate your attention and your enthusiasm in this jam-packed session of learning and creating. Our next webinar is happening soon in just a few weeks on March 5th. And we will actually, I think we're just about to drop a link in the chat in case you'd like to sign up and continue in a whole new different kind of perspective. This was all about dynamic student polling. We'll have new focus and new emphases and ideas next webinar series and we hope to see you there back again on the podium thank you again for joining in and continue learning continue sharing and we'll see you next time happy kahooting everyone